The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship at Second Reformed Church in Pella, Iowa, for the fourth Sunday of Lent, March 14th, 2021. We're outside. It's, it's a bit brisk. The snow here in the courtyard isn't fully melted, but we wanted to come outside because we're eager for spring and warm weather. It's a bright blue day. We hope you too are eager and uh, waiting for spring. I'm Steve Matinee Vanderwell, one of the pastors, and again, thanks for joining us. Soon you'll see Pastor Sophie and Pastor Katie, Krista Wilde, our music director. Today we have a special harp trio with Chris, as well as Janice Klein and Dave Barnes, and we thank them. If you're a regular, you know that each week we thank Jim Emmert and Lauren Blom for their amazing work, their creativity, their energy, their dedication. And may I just say that while we thank them, if you watch regularly, I'd encourage you to thank them for uh, what they've allowed us to do during this COVID time. You know, there have been some small silver linings in this pandemic. And one of them might be that there are also some of you out there who, who watch, who find this a little less threatening than walking through the door, and we understand that. And if you're just sort of dipping your toe into Second Reformed Church and catching a view, we hope that you like what you see. We hope that you're blessed today. And if you ever have questions or want to have a conversation, know that you can get in touch with one of the pastors by phone here. Check out our website, 2refpella.org. That's the number 2, R-E-F-P-E-L-L-A dot org. Send us an email. We'd like to hear from you. But enough of all that. Now let's get ready to worship God. Let's set aside those things that are spinning in our brain. Take a deep breath, and with that breath, draw in the Holy Spirit to bless this time of worship. Let us worship God. Our help is in the name of the Lord, creator of heaven and earth. Amen. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we belong to him. We will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love and faithfulness continue to all generations. Beloved in the Lord, as we gather for worship on this Lord's Day, it has been almost exactly one year since the authorities have declared a worldwide pandemic. And so in remembrance of that, let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. We have felt this day approaching in the back of our minds, O oh Lord, like a burden tilting toward us across the calendar. We have felt its long approach, and now it has arrived. Today, we pause to acknowledge 
one year of a global pandemic. One year of loss, isolation, sickness, death, and fear. In this hour, we take time to pause, to name the losses of this year, to acknowledge our anger, fatigue, frustration, and fear. To remember what is missing, what has changed, and what we long for. We pause to name the lessons we have learned, the new skills, values, and abilities that have come with adaptability. We pause to look around us, to be reminded of what is most precious and dear in this life and the spaces we have found anew. We pause to celebrate how far we have come through our tired trudging and our cheer, te cheeks wet with tears. We catch a glimpse of your presence, your love and your hope. We remember those who are no longer with us and those we have not seen for so long. And we name them now out loud. We do not ask that this grief be erased, but that the fingers of your grace would work these memories as a baker needs dough, till the leaven of rising hope transforms it from within into a form holding in these sorrows the surety of your presence. So that when we look again over this last year, we will see you in the deepest gloom of it, weeping with us, even as you hear, we hear you whispering that this is not the end, but only the still gray dawn before the world begins. And if that is so, then let that which has broken us this past year now be seen as the beginning of our remaking into Christ followers, more sympathetic, more compassionate, and more conscious of our frailty and our daily dependence upon you. As a people more invested in the hope of the resurrection of the body and the return of Christ than we have ever been before. Do not waste our great sorrows, O God, but use them to teach us to live in your presence, fully alive to pain and joy and hope in the places where our shattering and your shaping meet. Amen.
children, welcome to this time as well as all those who are young at heart. In today's psalm that we'll hear in a few moments, which is really a song from ancient Israel, you're going to hear the phrase from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. It's a phrase actually that's in the Bible quite a bit. And I think it's trying to tell us that God is everywhere to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, and all people are God's people. It's trying to tell us God is big. But it also reminds me of something we sometimes do in worship in the sanctuary with adults, is we use the four directions, north, south, east, west, to help us think about places and people we should pray for. So I thought today we would do that and if you're at home watching, I'd encourage you to stand up now and we are going to start by facing north. So you're going to have to look at the backside of me for a little while. So let's pray. Great God of all people and all directions, we turn north and we see towns up there where we may have friends or even if we don't, we pray for the people in Sully and Newton and Grinnell. We turn north and we see Pella Hospital, and we pray for all those who are sick as well as all the people that work at the hospital doing good work. We know that lots of us maybe have grandparents that live north of town someplace. So we pray for our grandparents. And now we're gonna turn west, and we look way, way to the west. We see beautiful places and big parks Maybe someday we can visit them. We thank you for the beauty of mountains and rivers and canyons and beaches. We pray for the buffalo and the bears and the antelopes that live there. When we're looking west, we remember too the people in Prairie City and Monroe and Des Moines, and we pray for them. Maybe we have cousins that live a little west of us. We pray for them. And now we're going to turn south, and we remember our friends in Haiti. We see Mexico if we live, look far enough, and we think of our friends there. We think of the people who live in Knoxville and Attica, Bussy and Harvey. We feel a warm spring wind blow on us from the south, and we are glad that it's warming up and spring is coming. And finally, we are going to face east where the sun rises each day. We thank you for every day that you give us. We look to the east and we see our schools and we ask that you'd bless our teachers and students and that all good things would happen at our schools. We see the people in Ottumwa and Oskaloosa and ask your blessing on them. We see the big cities in the east, and especially we pray for all the people in Washington, D.C., that they would make good and wise decisions. And when we look way, way to the east, we see the cross and the empty tomb where Jesus died and rose again so that we can be your children forever. And we are so glad that you love us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope maybe you could do that in your own way. You can think of things that you see when you face north and south and east and west. And now let's receive this blessing. You are God's beloved child. With you, God is well pleased. Amen. God felt absent to me when we were told that we were going to have to leave our home very quickly. We had lived there for over four years and had made friends that felt like family. And our kids had only really known that place uh, as their home and their retrievable memory. Um, in previous moves, I had felt the peace of God and felt his voice in different ways. But in this move, he felt silent to me. And it was a very uh, devastating and lonely time. And as we prepared to leave, we cried over and over again, and I cried many times that year after we left. 
Many of our friends and family told us when we returned that they were thankful and grateful that we were safe and they were so happy to see us, but inside I was feeling so broken and lonely. Over time, I came to see that God was comforting me in different ways and he made scripture that I hadn't looked at before come alive to me. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, the God of all comfort comforts us that we can comfort others. And that has become so real to me as I look at refugees and those who have had to leave homes that have burned down and other such things. Um, and so though I didn't hear him, feel him then, I know he was there. And my name is Stephanie and I live with a family of bikers, that is cyclists. Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. And now give ear to God's word as it comes to us from the Psalms, Psalm 107, verses 1 to 3, and then 17 to 22. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their troubles, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have shared a few times that while I was in college, I spent my summers working at a Young Life camp in northern Michigan. I loved my summers at camp. I often spent the morning sitting in a rocking chair looking out over the big field and down to the lake, the whole place buzzing with activity. Then I would head into the kitchen and spend the rest of the day laughing and singing while volunteers and I would prepare meals for hundreds of campers and staff. In the evening, I would walk home, often in the dark, the camp lit by tiki torches and twinkle lights. I could hear the commotion coming from the club room where kids were singing, playing games, and receiving a teaching about Jesus. My heart swelled as I walked the familiar path back to the intern house, affectionately named The Swamp. It was rare that I got to attend club due to my work hours, but at the end of every week, everyone on staff paused work to attend The Say-So. The Say-So took place right before campers got on their buses to go home. It was a chance to go around the room and campers would stand up one by one and share about how they encountered Christ during their week at camp. Some had just heard about Jesus for the first time. Others got to know him in a new way. But no matter what, now was the time to say so. I loved this time every single week. 
It encouraged me. It brought me deep joy and reminded me why I spent my days chopping potatoes, making hundreds of pounds of rice, and rolling thousands of enchiladas. I was helping set the table for kids to encounter the love of God in every corner of camp. Hearing them tell these stories at the end of the week kept me focused on what mattered. All of camp paused for that hour so every staff member, intern, and volunteer could be present to hear the campers' stories. As you might have guessed, this event got its name straight from our scripture passage today. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Much like our time in the club room at Young Life Camp, the psalmist's invitation is to speak up and share what God has done. All people from the north, south, east, and west are invited to give thanks to God. Other translations read, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their stories. Later on, the psalmist shares the hard stuff. Some were sick through their sinful ways. They endured affliction. They were near to the gates of death. And then they cried out to the Lord. They were healed, delivered, and redeemed. Then comes the invitation. Thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. Tell of his deeds with songs of joy. As I thought about this psalm in the context of our Honest to God series, I realized that often when I think of being honest to God, I think about sharing hard things. I associate honesty with God as being about doubts, pain, or questions. But this passage is an invitation to be honest about joy. In her book, Dare to Lead, researcher and professor Brene Brown says that joy is our most vulnerable emotion. This is what she says. When we can't tolerate that level of vulnerability, joy actually becomes foreboding, and we immediately move to self-protection. It's as if we grab vulnerability by the shoulders and say, you will not catch me off guard. I will be prepared and ready for you. So when something joyful happens, we start planning on being hurt. We start planning to deal with the fear of disappointment. Is this helpful? Of course not. Later, she goes on to explain that we are so sure that goodness will not last, that instead of celebrating the joy, we quickly move on or diminish it so we don't have as far to fall when the pain returns. This feels so true to me, and I wonder if it does for you as well. It was about five years ago, around this time of year, that I was accepted to seminary. I was really excited. It felt like a big deal. And yet shortly after receiving my acceptance letter, I started to spin. I didn't want to celebrate. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. What if it was a mistake? Maybe I shouldn't go. What if I hated it? And then I started classes. If I did well on an exam or paper, I quickly decided it was a fluke and next time I wouldn't get so lucky. I downplayed the joy. Everybody did well on that test. It was easy. When I took my first preaching class, I loved it. But I was so certain preaching was not for me, so I did not lean into the joy I felt in the pulpit. Seminary was full of these experiences. So much evidence of God's goodness, kindness, and faithfulness to me. So many reasons to feel joy and yet instead of celebrating them or sharing them with others or even thanking God for them, I downplayed it all. And like Brene Brown says, I started planning on how I would deal with the impending disappointment or hurt. 
I think these fears can be especially true after we have endured deep disappointment or loss. I had recently come out of a season of deep pain and sorrow surrounding my sense of call and vocation. So no wonder I was hesitant to lean into the joy of seminary. Perhaps you've come from a family that's been touched by divorce. It would make sense that your joy over seeing folks begin a new relationship or get married is cautious. You know the pain that's possible. Or getting pregnant after miscarriages. Of course someone might be nervous to celebrate the new life growing inside for fear they will endure more loss and grief. And yet life is rarely an either-or experience, joy or sorrow, celebration or grief. It is most often both and. And sometimes the joy can be the hardest to be honest about. Will our joy downplay someone else's sorrow? What if I celebrate the clean bill of health, but the cancer comes back? What if I share the joy of beginning a new relationship only for it to end a few months down the road? Do I tell others about a job interview? If in just a couple weeks, I might have to say that the other candidate was chosen? It might seem easier to keep the joy to ourselves. We may hesitate to share for fear of what might come next. And yet, I think this psalm is an invitation to honesty with God and others about the joy, about the ways God has redeemed us, about the wonderful things God has done for us, even or perhaps especially after pain. As verses 17 through 22 tell us, in the depths and in despair, even in rebellion, God hears us cry out, and will rescue us. God will redeem us with steadfast love, and so we give thanks. We sing songs of joy, and I think we are invited to do so with confidence. Throughout this series of Honest to God Psalms, we have been asking where Jesus might have prayed these psalms. I wonder if after being tempted in the wilderness, Jesus remembered this psalm. As he came out of the 40-day-long trial, if he thought of these words, Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and he healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about his glorious acts. Or, maybe after his conversation with the woman at the well, he thought of the beginning of this psalm and encouraged the woman to go and tell her story. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Today marks one year since we canceled our first church service because of the pandemic. We remember the sorrow. We acknowledge our grief. We gently hold the sadness, the fear, and the anger. It is good and it is right to do this. It is impossible to overstate the collective grief and sorrow of this last year. And it is also good and right to tell our stories of where we see redemption, to thank the Lord for his wonderful works to humankind, to sing songs of joy. Just like in the club room at Young Life Camp, it is important to pause for our very own say-so. Here are a few of mine. In this last year, I got Twyla, my crazy and playful pup. I have walked thousands of steps around my neighborhood, recognizing more and more faces each time, 
telling me that I am settling into this town. I have discovered the beauty of the trails by Lake Red Rock. I have practiced rest. I began working with a spiritual director. I've had the delight of each week reading through The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with a young member of our congregation. And this is just the beginning. These are great joys to me. This is God's kindness to me and tangible evidence of God's steadfast love. Do the joys negate the pain? No, but neither does the pain negate the joy. Sharing joy in the midst of sorrow is vulnerable. Even as I speak my joys out loud, I feel some worry rise up in me. What if I'm disappointed again? The truth is, I will be. Sorrow ebbs and flows with the joy. But today, the invitation is to join the psalmist. Let us, the redeemed, say so. As we begin to slowly come out of this year of pain and sorrow, let us give thanks for God's goodness to us. Let us sing songs of joy. Let us practice honesty and have courage to name the beauty and the goodness. I invite you to find some time this week with a friend or a family member to tell your stories, to be honest about the kindness and the joy of the Lord you have experienced in this last year. Perhaps it seems small. Name it anyway. Let us join the psalmist in telling our stories. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. During the season of Lent, our affirmation of faith comes from 2 Corinthians. Let us say what we believe. We have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be clear that the extraordinary power comes from God and does not come from us. We are often troubled, but not crushed. We sometimes doubt, but we do not despair. We are attacked, but not abandoned. Sometimes badly hurt, but not destroyed. We are always carrying Jesus' death in our bodies, that Jesus' life may also be revealed in our bodies. As we come to this time of prayer, I would invite you, if you're able and willing, to kneel with me as a sign of humility and rest in the loving presence of God. So let us pray. Great, loving, everlasting one, now for a few moments... We come before you and we want to kneel to remind ourselves that we are small and that you are big, to remind ourselves that you hold us and even now may we feel your embrace filling us with hope and trust. So we give to you now all of that that is jumbled inside of us. Our expectations, our joys, our hopes, as well as our anxieties, our wounds, our fears. And by your Holy Spirit, untangle all that is inside of us. You know the things that keep us up at night the resentments, the wounds that gnaw at us. Holy Spirit, take our sighs and our moans and make them into prayers. And come even right now and smooth us, soothe us, give us that peace that is beyond human understanding.
we pray for the many who are enjoying spring break and maybe some have even gotten to travel. Bless their travels, but also may they find their time to be restful and joyful and refreshing. We thank you for how well schools have done through this pandemic, that they have been safe, and we thank you for the flexibility of the students and the dedication of the teachers. And then we pray for our young people, especially as we move toward the end of an academic year. And decisions need to be made, futures are charted. Bless those, especially as they think about marriage, career, location. Guide them with good choices, choices that will bless them, but also bring glory to your name. We pray for the children of the world, so many in need, so many hungry, so many orphans. Oh Lord, have mercy. Fill us with compassion and creativity that we may pray for them, but we may also do for them. And we pray for the children of this church, many of whom we have not seen for a year now and have grown and changed. Bless them even as we look forward to the day when we gather together in this time and in this place. We pray for the ill, those going through treatments. We pray for Dale and Michael, Val, Tony, Rod. And for whom else shall we pray? We thank you that the vaccine is becoming more and more available. And we look forward, O oh Lord, to the day when this pandemic is completely behind us. Thank you for researchers and scientists who have brought this gift to us in the way that you have blessed them. Help us to be hopeful and vigilant in these days ahead. Fill us now with trust and hope that as we go forth in this week ahead, we may know that your spirit will fill us with wisdom and words and gestures better and greater than our own, that we might be your children, your witnesses in this world, and we might point toward Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We've come to that time in the service when we bring our gifts and our offerings to God. And I want you to take a look at the shape of our chancel. There are symbols here of God's gift to us. God's gift of forgiveness and cleansing and being made a part of God's family through baptism. In the pulpit, the gift of the word by which our lives are transformed as we come to know God and Jesus Christ through the word. And then finally, the gift of being fed at Christ's table, something that brings all of us together into that eschatological feast when we will all rejoice in God's presence. So these are symbols of God's gifts to us. And now we are given the opportunity to bring our gifts to God, our time, our talent, our treasure. Let us offer those for the service of God. Into the river I will wade There my 
beloved, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.